are now officially beginning uh, the class on molecular relationship. We're talking about the three keys to happiness. The first key is communication, and we're spending um, uh, a little bit of time on that. And without communication, there's not much chance of having a happy relationship. Now, there are two types of communication. There are deceptive communication and honest communication. Now, why in the world would anyone use deceptive communication? For one thing, what the biggest excuse people have is, well, you have to be, use a little deception in your communication or else you can hurt people's feelings. So what do you think? Is this a good excuse or a cop-out? Do we need to be deceptive in our communication to avoid hurting feelings? Cop-out. What would you say, Joshua? I said cop-out. Yeah. And why, why is that a cop-out? Why is it not necessary to deceive? Because you're just basically putting off conflicts instead of resolving them, and ultimately the conflict or discrepancy is going to come up later. Right. There's a couple of reasons behind the deceptive communication that uh, uh, oftentimes a deceptive communication seems to be necessary because you're covering up a previous deception. Let's take the affair, for instance. person has an affair. So uh, even if he feels guilty about it, he thinks, well... I can't tell my spouse about the affair because it would really hurt him or her, okay? So he's uh, really deceptive about his communication because of a previous deception. The affair itself was uh, happened in the dark. So uh, one deception leads to another deception leads to another. So what the person has to do is not deceive to begin with. If the person is unhappy in his relationship, instead of having an affair in secret, he should just break it off and then go have the, a new relationship. Instead, the people tend to follow the line of least resistance. And say if the relationship is going bad, the easiest thing to do is to flirt with somebody else and get romantic energy from another source and uh, then this will often lead to an affair and then the person has to be deceptive and this is the line of least resistance the line of most resistance which is what we need to take is to confront the problem if the problem if there's a solution to the problem to make the relationship work so the person doesn't need that romantic energy from an outside source. If he can do that, then uh, uh, things can work out. If it can't work out, then he's a lot better to just break off the relationship, be honest about it, explain why it won't work and move on to a new relationship. And that way the person can have work with complete, honest communication. And people are often looking for a ticket out of a difficult situation. So they want to get out of this relationship and they look for someone else to stimulate their emotions. And it's only a, a temporary thing. It's like a ticket out of a difficult situation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this deception to avoid hurt. That's, uh, uh, now let's suppose that, uh, now the affair is an extreme example, but uh, let's suppose that you have a spouse that uh, is creating a piece of artwork and you don't think that person is a good artist, but he or she's really trying. Okay. So should you tell her that, hey, your, your artwork sucks? 
<laughs> well, how, how, how should you communicate? And she says to you, boy, what do you think of this picture I drew of you and you don't really like it? Um, can you still be honest? What do you think? Who wants to answer that? I, I'd like to answer that, JJ. <laughs> I, think, I think it is possible to be honest. And I think in the kind of scenario you just outlined, the key would be to first say something positive about the artwork. And there's got to be something positive you can find about the artwork without, you know, coming off sounding fake or phony. And then just offer uh, some constructive, keyword constructive criticism. Yeah, have Not, you ever met anyone that just, uh, they criticize you, it sounds like an attack when you think they could have been a lot more diplomatic, you know? Cause yeah. That, and then you say, well, boy, why are you attacking me like this? And they'll just say, well, I'm just being honest. You want me to be honest, don't you? You know, you're lousy at this, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, you know, there are certain words that you just don't use if you're trying to uh, help a friend. You don't word, use the word lousy or terrible or these negative words in describing. So let's go in this uh, painting piece of artwork the gal's doing and the guy says uh, he doesn't really like the portrait she did of him but he could say something like this well doesn't really look like me that much but you know this is a uh, quite a bit better than your last attempt <laughs> so you can, <laughs> I tell so her you're making can progress we, here can we hang it on can we hang it on the refrigerator door <laughs> well, here's here's what I would do. It's it's in uh, Jill alluded to it. It's called the sandwich approach. Uh, and the first is the layer of of bread, and that's the coating. And you you say something positive. Wow, I see you put a lot of time and effort into this. Wow, that's amazing that you you care about me that much that you would you know put that much time into it. Oh, by the way. There's a class, there's an art class starting that you might want to attend that might just help you improve just a little bit, you know, along, that's the meat now that you're putting in the, in the sandwich and, and that's the corrective. But rather than attack, you say, you give her a, a positive uh, idea. Well, there's a class forming that, you know what, I think might even make you a better artist. And then you say something positive, that's the other layer of bread and that is, Let's see, where can we put this? You know, there's a, <laughs> there's a piece on the bottom uh, on my trailer door that I think would look really good. <laughs> yeah, where nobody will see it. <laughs> uh, that's the sandwich approach. So you say something positive, then the truth, and then something positive. Yeah, the fact is when anyone starts out developing any talent, he's not very good. So... Uh, it's important that we give encouragement in that. And one of the, I think one of the greatest sins a person can make is to, well, that was sweet there. Um, one of the greatest sins a person can do is to criticize a child that's trying to attempt something. And you hear stories about people's telling about when they were a child, their parents came to them and they discouraged them and it kind of uh, hurt them for life. And oftentimes you hear of people saying that all my life I've been trying to get my dad or my mom to, to acknowledge that I'm a talented person or good in this area. And so, uh, uh, like Jesus said, uh, woe unto him who offends one of these little ones. It's better that a millstone be hung around his neck and be drowned into the depths of the sea. And so uh, when you think of little children especially, uh, we need to be very careful about how we talk to them and uh, encourage them. Reminds me one of our, my our grandsons was visiting us a while back and he was playing and accidentally hit a lamp and broke it. And uh, Artie, first of all, <clears throat> he 
you know, the natural instinct was to uh, express alarm and he started crying and then Artie grabbed him and says, well, you know, I can replace this light, but I can't replace my grandson. So she gave him a hug and tried to comfort him and, and I thought that was sweet. But if he broke that lamp and then we just reamed him and told him that was terrible and he needs to repent or whatever, it could have scarred him for life. And just little things like this are really important with children. Now, all of us have the child within us still to some degree. So we still are kind of fragile. So we need to be diplomatic. We can be honest, yet diplomatic. And some people think to be honest, you just got to rip the guy a new one, you know, and that's not really true at all. You can uh, recognize that people are imperfect and uh, communicate with them honestly, but in a positive way. If you have a positive mindset, you will communicate with positivity to the other person. And this is, this is really important to recognize that uh, we have, each of us have that fi fragile child still in us to a degree. And we, we like, each of us like to be pampered. We, each of us need a little bit of praise now and then to keep us, keep us going. And so uh, uh, we like to think of ourselves sometimes as superhuman that we don't need this and we don't need that, but all of us need the support of our friends and our family, our associates to a degree. And there's a certain number of people we can do without the support, but it's important that each of us get some support from our fellow humans. I'd also say it's important to be honest in asking the question. Like if, if you're disingenuously asking it, like you don't really want a real answer, you just want somebody to puff you up, then you know you have to be honest with the question as well as the answer. Yeah, another point that makes me think of is like, they say the, the most uh, dangerous question that a guy can be asked is, does this dress make me look fat or do you think my thighs are too fat or my bottom is too big or whatever? <laughs> it's, that's very, that's a terrifying question for a guy to be asked. But what's interesting about that is the person that asks that question is usually uh, in pretty good shape. The person that's really extremely overweight is usually very self-conscious of it that they don't even bring that up usually. They don't say, do you think I'm too fat when they're obviously too fat? You know, they don't even ask that. But the, pe the, the people that ask that are usually uh, very conscientious about how they look. And they may look like, a the person may look like a knockout yet, uh, very critical of themselves. So uh, you can actually answer honestly, generally to that question. Well, you know, you look great to me. So that's a <laughs> well, the, the flip side of it. I watched this, some video on Facebook. Some woman's like the five things women should never ask men. Cause oh, really? <laughs> one of them was, was, does she look prettier than me? You know, this, this woman. Oh, yeah. And the, the flip side of that is like, yeah, if you're like 300 pounds, you're not going to ask, does this dress make me look fat? But people asking, does this woman look prettier than me? They never pick out some woman they, they think is uglier than them. They always pick out somebody who's as attractive or prettier than them. Yeah. So the thing is, like, if you ask somebody a question and you're going to get upset with the answer you think they're going to give you, then the only option is th they're going to upset you or they're going to lie to you. So you're setting your relation up for a bad track where you get into a fight over something or you're setting your, your partner up to have to lie to you about something. Yeah, sometimes people do in relationships where, you know, they're not, the union isn't really that great. The per, one person will try to trap the other person into saying something negative. So they will have an excuse to attack them or be offended. And 
that's too bad when that happens. But uh, in that case, the pers- they need to have honest communication about communication itself. I, I'd like to comment that um, I think when most people say they want to be honest, it's usually their ego saying that they want to say what their opinion is. And if you're, when, I, when somebody asks me to be honest, I, I'm thinking, is it my ego that wants to say what I, my ego thinks is honest? Or is it my higher self that wants to portray a truth? And so I, I use that as one of my benchmarks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a... Uh, uh, another... Yeah, go ahead, Rick. Another big difference between the uh, truth and, and uh, deception is that if you tell the truth, it's much more efficient because you only have to tell it once. It's not going to change. But if you tell a lie... Every time you tell it, it's going to have to be uh, uh, amended, or, uh, added to, or whatnot. Lies just keep getting worse. So that uh, Abraham Lincoln that says, "No man has a good enough memory to be a good liar." <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But uh, okay, now honest communication is difficult because of two basic fears: one, the fear of hurting others that we've talked about, and second, the fear of becoming vulnerable and hurting oneself. So we're, uh, we're afraid of hurting other people. We think, well, well, I don't want to tell them that that picture isn't very good or whatever. But the other is hurting oneself. And uh, again, we go back to the affair is the prime example of this is that sure, the person may think if I tell this person about the affair that I had, uh, it'll hurt her, but he, he's really thinking of himself here because he thinks, well, I might wind up getting a divorce, losing my kids, have to give her half my assets. And so it's really going to hurt me as she finds out, he or she finds out about this affair. So uh, uh, the fear, so really it's uh, this lack of communication and this way is uh, just selfishness rather than thinking of uh, uh, the, the greater good. No yeah, more. I think most people, that's, that's probably the biggest lie a lot of people tell themselves is I, I'm lying or avoiding this because I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, when in actuality it's them feeling uncomfortable about saying it rather than the interest of the other person. Yeah, exactly. And both fears are illusions in this upside down shadowy world. The truth is the opposite of the way most people think. Hurt is caused by a lack of communication or deceptive communication, not honest communication. Honest communication only hurts when it exposes deceptive communication. That's an interesting thing to think on. So honest communication only hurts when it exposes deceptive communication. And so you can be honest without hurting people as long as you don't have deception built in there somewhere. And so uh, the deceptive communication is where where there's hurt involved, there's usually some deception either in the present or in the past. Now, everyone has a strong desire for full communication. But how that can be achieved is a question. What must be achieved here to have honest communication is to let down our walls and release our fears. And going back to the point that uh, we made earlier in the fact that each of us has to see that we are invulnerable. And it's like uh, we forget this and because we see that we are capable of being hurt, this creates a fear. And so this fear of being hurt needs to be overcome and the way to overcome it is to realize that no matter how much anyone attempts to hurt you, no matter how much Uh, your mistakes cause hurt to yourself is you will survive and you can 
and you can go through this and after you go through it, you will still be there and be stronger than before. And then you, when you go through this period of purging, uh, you will be stronger and uh, more, more uh, capable of honest communication than before. So having that, that sense that nothing can destroy you. And this is the, what creates a fear. People have kind of this fear of being vulnerable that I could, it's almost like I could be destroyed or almost equivalent to being uh, uh, sentenced to firing squad in people's minds when they have to face their own problems, their own deceptions, their, uh, their criticism and rejection by others. And, but this, this belief in your invulnerability that uh, what you really have, that your pure soul energy is impossible to attack and destroy. And when the disciple realizes this, then he can proceed forward and always take the upward path rather than having to deter. As long, one, as, long as, as long as one is polarized in the world of feeling and allows emotions to govern decision-making, he will generally communicate with some degree of deception. For his emotional self greatly fears pain for himself and others and is willing to deceive to avoid it. So that's an important point. Now the solution is to yield control to the mind which can accept a degree of pain and use logic instead of feeling. So this is the big problem with average humanity is they put more attention on emotion than thought. Because over 90% of common humanity focuses much more on emotion than mind and thought. And when they're focused on emotion, then they always fear about their vulnerability. They'll fear attack, they'll fear um, about their feelings being hurt, about uh, uh, embarrassment or all kinds of different things we, we uh, fear. But there, most of our fears are generated around the emotions. And the key to being able to transcend fear is the mind. The mind can look at things and say, this fear is unnecessary. And so uh, sometimes it's not that easy. You can say, uh, the mind can say, well, this fear is not logical, but even though it's not logical, the emotions, the emotional self will say, yeah, well, that's easy for you to say. <laughs> and so the emotions will take control. And the key to remember is energy follows thought. The, that's probably the most important principle the disciple can learn is energy follows thought. And the fact that uh, uh, we often divert our thoughts toward a negative emotion without even thinking about it. In other words, <clears throat> what happens is we kind of uh, abnegate our uh, a power of thought and just settle on the power of feeling. And so we, we, we will oftentimes glide along just on the feeling energy without applying any thought. So the disciple must turn this around and not let his feelings dominate and uh, shift his attention as much as possible to the mind. So he, if, when his attention is on the mind, he can then direct his feelings. And when you have power to direct your feelings, then you can produce a stable environment where you can stay in a state of 
of uh, content or even happiness on a fairly permanent basis. Now, there are things that can happen, like you get in an accident or something like that that can really upset your day, no matter how mental you are. But overall, this principle really works. And it also helps you avoid accidents, avoid circumstances in life that uh, are really negative. Have you ever noticed that some people just seem to have really bad luck in their minds? That they, ha they have um, uh, one thing happened to them and then pretty few days later, something else terrible happens to them. And then several other days later, they have something else horrible happens to them and they're always complaining about these circumstances and then you meet other people that uh, they don't complain at all you know life seems to just glide along what's, so what's the difference between these two sets of people um, now I suppose let's pick on Pamela here we haven't picked on her for a while have you met people like that, Pamela, that uh, just seem to have disaster after disaster in their life for, and they, they, in their minds, it just comes out of nowhere? Uh, not really, no. Really? Really? No. Wow. Have you, most of your friends are pretty positive then, huh? I think so. Well, maybe because you're positive, you just uh, attract positive people. That's my intention. Yes. <laughs> well, good for you. Let's pick on somebody else and that, um, let's see. Oh, who shall we pick on? Haven't picked on Ed for a while. Ed, have you met people that just uh, seem to have a disaster after disaster in their life? Well, I have, and those people are the ones who's, they're always thinking about disasters. Yeah. You know, whatever you put in your attention is where your mind goes. I learned that when I was 15, but my the teachings were given, were given to me that what you put in your attention is where your life goes. Now, when, and, you, when you think of the people you met that just have disaster after disaster in their life and other people that just their life goes pretty smoothly, which, which of the two people or or most pleasant to be around? Well, as you and I know, it's most pleasant to be around harmony. We don't like conflict, we like harmonious people and people whose, whose way of being in the world is pleasant and harmonious. Yeah, it's in, it is an interesting correspondence. So people that are pleasant and have a good attitude uh, just you know, their, their health is better, they have fewer accidents, uh, uh, they don't have a big financial thing, distress around the corner every 10 minutes and mm -hmm. things like this. So just the, thing, Jay, the Jay, mind makes a tremendous Jay, difference. Yeah. What'd you say, Stacy? Uh, I was going to say that, that um, our, uh, we, we make our world every day. Uh, the way we think and the way things we do, uh, we produce what we get involved in. And uh, we're co-creators with God. You know, that was a, a, our gift. And so we create our day, create our day. And you run across people who are always forgetting things, dropping things, are kind of a nuisance to themselves. Uh, that's what's in their mind. Uh, they're creating that. And if you look back, Earlier in the day, they probably created the afternoon, or if not, go back another day or another day, and their whole life is like that. So uh, you have to show them to break that chain, uh, thinking on a different uh, thought pattern, getting that energy flowing in a, in a different way instead of straight forward into disaster all day long. They're always thinking, oh, well, I don't know, if, I don't want to take this because I might forget this. Uh, you know, my wife's uh, area like that sometimes. <laughs> I'm glad she can't hear me say area. But anyway, uh, yeah, that's a uh, main. Yeah, everybody, everybody has their problems, but uh, you can take two people with an equal amount of problems and one person, when they describe their life, it will sound like their life is a disaster. And the other guy with a similar number of problems 
uh, has a positive attitude, it sounds like his life is, uh, uh, is really great. Yet they're, they're encountering uh, similar situations. And the situation is different because of the way the two think. Because everybody does have their problems, no matter. Uh, I, I haven't talked to anybody that I've, they say, think their life is problem free. <laughs> well, I don't think about all, all the conspiracies in life, but I see the people who are always talking about the, uh, all these conspiracies and all these different things that are going wrong and all these different types of diets and what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat. And I don't worry about any of that, you know, and I'm as healthy as uh, the next person or probably more. So uh, what you, you think, keep your mind on the good, the true and the beautiful and all things will be added unto you. Yeah, that was one of the thoughts I posted uh, the other day was that uh, uh, people, some of the healthiest people just don't put any attention on diet or exercise or anything. They just have a good attitude. And uh, that attitude has carried them uh, through life very successfully quite often. I think all of us know people like that. Now, most of us in this group, for instance, are into health and uh, good eating and stuff like that. But we all know people that just think, uh, don't put any attention on it at all. Some of them have disastrous health, but then there's a handful that just have such a attitude and also good genes that uh, combination that uh, just carries them through, which, it kind of teaches us the power of the mind and the positive attitude can carry us a long way out of uh, uh, thinking, diet, and exercise, and every other uh, health benefit. Probably thinking is, is number one in, in maintaining uh, good health. I think... Uh... Well... I also think that, uh, you know, people who are too much, I'm also, I also think that those who are always uh, concerned about their health, it could be uh, because of a past life experience that uh, the record of their thing about their present oh, yeah, life. Past life has anyway, a, those who stay, yeah, yes. yeah, past life has a tremendous effect. We have our karmas and everything. And some uh, very positive people, who I've, I've met people who had have, uh, terrible uh, health problems, probably from karma, but they still have a positive attitude and it doesn't prevent them from making the best of what they have. Which is if you try to be wise and concentrate on wisdom, you will automatically do the right things. Yeah, that's the key is to make our thinking uh, work in such a way that we will automatically do what is right. Now, establishing true communication where it previously did not exist takes a great deal of aggressive energy. Honest communication does not occur among emotionally polarized people by going with the flow. And this going with the flow thing was uh, uh, something that was almost a mantra a decade or two ago. Among new age people, they always always talked about going with the flow. But there are two flows. <laughs> there's the materialistic flow that takes us into matter, and then there's the spiritual flow that takes us out of matter. And when we're into matter, the flow, if you go with the flow, you go the wrong direction. It's when you focus on spirit that you pick up the spiritual flow. And until the disciple focuses on the soul and the spirit, uh, he, the only flow he will sense will be the flow in the wrong direction. It takes him to the world of uh, coarser matter, coarser uh, feelings. And remember, there are lower and higher feelings. The higher feelings are great. They will help us. The lower feelings keep us polarized and focused in the wrong direction. 
Now to learn honest communication, the seeker must examine every thought expressed uh, by himself and others. I think it was Socrates that says, the life unexamined is not worth living. So we have to examine our lives, and this is one thing that the ancient wisdom teaches, is uh, we should examine our life at the end of every day. Just before you go to sleep, think of your day and what you did right or what you did wrong, what you could have done better. So examine your life every day, and then... He says this, examine your life very carefully over each 10 year period. Uh, Each 10 year period, look and see where you were 10 years ago and where you are today and look at the trends. The trends will tell you where your soul is guiding you. It will give you clues. So what happened in the last 10 years that kind of pushed you one direction or the other. And this will give you clues as to uh, the purpose your soul is gently pushing you toward. Now, sometimes it's not gentle if we, sometimes we need a big push, but uh, normally it is gentle. The soul tries to be as gentle as it can until we, become so deaf to it that it has to uh, do something to kind of jolt us back to reality. But uh, yeah, examine our lives in, uh, in various cycles. Now that's not the only cycles, also our whole life. If your say the midpoint of the typical life is 35 to 40. So once you get that age, look at your, uh, your life up to that point and see how you've progressed and then try to project what the second half of your life will be like. Now, if you're older like me and no Ed over here, um, the thing to do is look at your life up to about 35 or so and then look at it since that and see the difference in the two cycles and then think, well, we've may maybe not have that many more years left so where can we go in the few years we have left and i'm sure ed joins me thinking well let's hope it's not a few let's hope it's a bunch of bunch of years we got left huh ed (laughs) well i don't uh try to think about how many years i have left i try to think about what can i do today and another thing, too, is that I realized everything has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And uh, we don't always know the day of the end comes, but uh, we have to try to make the best of what we have right now. I, I'm just betting that Ed lives to be 100, and when he's 100 years old, he's still going to be pretty frisky. So I think we ought to set a goal to have a 100th birthday for Ed celebration. What year is that going to be, Ed? What year were you born? 1938. Okay, so that'd be 2038 will be Ed's 100th birthday. Well, you know, I tell you what, I'm not concerned about that because it's like having a car, you know, when the car wears out, you may not need it anymore. Well, we need we need lots of reasons to celebrate. So that would be a good reason to celebrate seeing you. let's, Let's celebrate tomorrow. (laughs) <laughs> okay, tomorrow we'll celebrate day. tomorrow too. <laughs> so anyway, uh, let's hope all of us can uh, live as long as we want to live. And you know, some people uh, just uh, uh, don't want to live to be a hundred. Maybe they live to be fifty, sixty, and their soul thinks, "Well." He's pretty much accomplished everything he needs to accomplish in this life, so it's time for him to go. So that's the reason some people do die early. We don't know what real life is. We think this is real life. This is this is a school of experience. We may graduate and have real life. Yeah, every day is my birthday. <laughs> yeah, but the key, uh, yeah, is not is to think, focus on life and vitality and uh, the important thing is to always have a goal if if you don't have one well find something 
find a goal to work on. This gives you a purpose in life. Okay, any other comments or questions before we sign well, off? How about finding a goal uh, of um, seeking eternal life uh, and bypassing the death and birth cycle by um, meditation and its applied disciplines? Uh, if you can do that, you can uh, eventually fall into this uh, tunnel of light, so to speak, and uh, it'll help guide you to. Uh, what you seek in life. You know, we all are what we think, just like you said, uh, energy follows thought, but this energy that follows thought is constructing our world and what we want. And if we think uh, long and hard on it, meditate on it, you'll see that uh, this restriction is only because we're dualistic. We think we're the body and uh, there's a spirit out there, but not realizing that we are the spirit. We are that, what we seek. Well, the initiations that uh, the ancient wisdom talks about is removing restrictions. So what each disciple must do is find out what is limiting him or her right now, and then work to remove that limitation. Now, there are all kinds of limitations. Even the masters have limitations. Even the planetary and solar logos have limitations they're seeking to remove. And so uh, uh, for us, if we expand our consciousness up to removing a limitation that the planetary logos is working on, we're, it's like trying to move uh, 10 steps up a ladder in one step. So if you climb on the ladder, you need to climb one step at a time. So the disciple needs to find that next step, that next limitation. What is limiting you right now at this moment? And it's a little bit different for each individual here. Each individual here has something that's limiting uh, him or her that needs to be tackled. And the problem with many disciples, or it happens to all of us one time or another, is we're working on the wrong step. And when we work on the wrong step, things don't go right. And eventually we find that right step. And when we find the right step, then we will have a sense of peace that because that sense of peace will come because the soul is saying you're headed the right direction, you're working on the right thing. And when you are, you'll have a sense about you that, uh, uh, just a sense that things are working, that you're doing what you're supposed to. And if you're not, then you can feel depressed, you can feel a vacuum. And if you do feel kind of uh, depressed or vacuum or like you're going nowhere, it means that you're not seeing your correct next step. When you see that next step uh, and you begin to take it, you just have a feeling that you're headed the right direction and it will feel really good. And you'll feel a sense of purpose. You will not feel depressed. You'll feel like pressing on. So that said, any other comments before we move on, before we close out here? When you come to a fork in the road, take I think it. I could add. When you come to a fork in the I road. I think what? I could add that. Uh... I said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Yeah, right. <laughs> the Buddhists say if, if you would find life, you must give up life. That means give up life that you think it is. Yeah, good points. Okay, any other comment? I have one that I, I, I found this concept that I think I could put into one sentence. It was saying that creation equals looking for and then finding that which you looked for. That's, that's in hell. Yeah. Okay, that's good that's thought. Creation. On that thought, well, also you got to understand, yeah, that uh, you you find what you look for, but uh, yeah, what uh, when you're looking for that next step, uh, you, you, I think the best way to find it is first seek the God within you, seek your Lord, and as you seek your God, you seek your Lord, your answers will come to you, your next step will come to you. 
everything will come to you. But seek the love of your Lord first, and all answers will be given. And that's a problem that's with soul start. contact is there's a lot of distractions to take you away from it. So it doesn't come just easy. The person needs to, to uh, look within by the power of his directed thought. And then, then uh, yeah. uh, so that's a good point, Stacy. Okay, uh, let's, uh, we'll see you guys next Sunday, all being well at uh, 2 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. And until that time, have a great week. And remember uh, to call upon the presence during the week. I have an announcement. Okay. In two weeks, the keys of knowledge will be 22 years old. Oh, wow. You're right. It's amazing how fast time has gone. Amazing. <laughs> you know. Okay, well, great, great group. You're a good, good group of Yeah, people. look at all them twos. Oh, that means the molecular group is now three years old as of a week ago or week, two weeks ago. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Oh, great. Okay, we'll Two see you guys next week. Good to have you. Thank you, everybody. Thank right. you, JJ. Bet. Enjoy. Bye. Thank you. Bye.